Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Digital Adoption Show. As we come to the end of the season, we are excited to bring you something special and sweet to warm your hearts as you step into this new year with us. We have curated some memorable moments from season 3 and selected our top 5 discussions that have fueled our minds and souls along with sharing ideas that shape the modern workplace. Our first excerpt comes from a great discussion with Don McKendry, team lead for IT learning and development at Ameris Bank. Her conversation with Shreya, customer success manager at Wattfix, revolved around how the five-phase digital adoption is transforming the banking experience for customers. Don provided some amazing insights into how banks are leveraging digital adoption to offer seamless experiences to their customers. Well, and and our perspective for helping business customers because mm-hmm. you know, you, you can apply Wattfix to customer interface systems. Now, we haven't done that just yet. We're kind of taking I wouldn't say baby steps. Our first step was a baby step. Then we took a big step. And, you know, our next step will, of course, be to start to invite this tool and its services to our customers. So we're not there yet as far as what they can touch, but what they can experience is how we touch what fix, how we work with what fix. And what that brings them yeah. is efficiency, mm-hmm. you know. It brings them confidence because when you want to work with someone, especially when it's related to your money, right? Your money is your livelihood. It's your family's livelihood. It's an important thing, right? And so when you go to a place that is handling your money, if you see a lack of confidence or a lack of ability, something takes a long time, which kills the confidence you have, that already builds the initial framework to not the best interaction that you can have. And so our way of touching customers at this moment is to offer our employees the ammunition they need to handle whatever scenario is going to come at them. And of course it's only as good as we can fortify it, but if I know even brand new coming out of training, if mm-hmm. I know that I can find how to enroll this person in a CD, maybe I didn't retain mm-hmm. that in class. And if I was in class, mm-hmm. that would be a true statement, y'all. I don't really know how to do it, yeah. but I don't want my customer to see that. I don't want my manager mm-hmm. to see that either, but I have this resource and I can say, all right, Mr. Smith, let's take care of that CD for you now. I'm going to hit my little workflow and I'm going to go just go do that. And that creates right there a self-confidence and the efficiency that we did not have to call our manager or our trainer to say, I don't remember how to do this or look it up in the manual for five or six minutes. Meanwhile, the customer's like, "Mm, where's the other guy? Does he Mm -hmm. he know? So the bank felt like, look, we have so many systems. Every company does, you know, it's not, it's not just for banks or whatever. We have so many systems and what we can do for our employees, which also is for our customers, is to give them some sort of help. So this is the help we invested in. And so far, we think that is making the positive impact, whether it's for reputation, whether it's for efficiencies and comfort, we do feel like we are making that for our customer. And in a banking industry where competition is pretty high, we got a lot of banks, right? You can bank your money with anybody. So now you got to figure out who do you want to bank your money with and why? And if it becomes a comfort and confidence thing, which it usually Mm -hmm. is, that's how we've done it. Moving on, we had a delightful episode featuring Carrie Berg, Vice President of L&D at Teladoc Health. In her conversation with Tamanna, Growth Marketing Head at Wattfix, Carrie debunked the widely misinterpreted notion that personal growth is disconnected from professional development. She shared her insights on how leaders evolve through learning at work, along with some compelling analogies. Here's the highlight from that enlightening discussion. You know, people always say, like, I'm different at work than I am at home, and you are. You know, you don't show up to work with bedhead in your pajamas most of the time. Now, now with the pandemic, some of us are still coming to work in our pajamas and maybe with a little bedhead. But I think, you know, you you are two different people, but a lot of, of how what you believe and how you act and what's important to you from like an ethos, mor- morality, like how you want to live your life is very similar. So in general, most of us want to grow. 
We want to be better at our jobs and we want to be better in our personal lives. Like this is why we, there's so much, you know, tools and things out there with how to be more organized, how to finish projects, you know, how to reading books, all of that. So, you know, I think that <clears throat> while we may behave differently personally and professionally, what's up here and what we grow in our brain and, and grow in how we think and approach people and build relationships and all of that goes between both both our work life and our and our personal life. Mm -hmm. I also think that, you know, every moment is a learning opportunity. Even walking around the grocery store and watching how people interact is a is a moment to understand how people think, listen, communicate, and all of that. And you can do the same thing at work. You know, I learned a lot about leadership development just by watching people in meetings talk to each other. So I think that they both can be very much connected. And it's really what you take from that to to change. And, and then the other key piece of that is having a, a good amount of self-awareness and knowing what you're good at, what you're not good at, what how your behaviors are interpreted, and what are the things that you need to do differently in order to, to move ahead and to grow your skills. I'll put them in the bucket of watching people really evolve their emotional intelligence and their ability to connect with people. And, you know, you'll say that there's, don't cry at work. There's no emotions at work. And, you know, at times that may be true, but I think actually appreciating that we're all humans and appreciating that we all have emotions and that we all feel a certain way <clears throat> actually allows leaders to grow and to be better. <clears throat> and so along those lines, it's, it's appreciating that people don't think the same way that you do and they don't feel the same way that you do about certain things. Like I, I, I always kind of use the analogy of like, some people are really, really, really crazy about their cars. If you have one, somebody can have it be filthy, dirty. They don't care. It just gets them from A to B. And then you'll meet somebody who takes their car to the wash three days a week and it's spotless and all of that. But if you don't validate that both are our solid methods of transportation, <laughs> you know, like you're, you're saying that the other person is less than you because they don't keep your car, their car as clean. And I think, you know, I've watched some leaders really evolve where they finally get to see like, just because their car isn't as clean as mine doesn't mean that they're any less of a person and they're not, you know, not to be respected and all that. And in fact, I should think about why they think that way and how it could teach me something different. Mm -hmm. So just using the little car analogy, I think is a great example of, of how leaders can really evolve. If we think that there's only one way to do something and that everybody needs to think the same way that we do and respond with the same type of passion about a clean car versus a dirty car, like we're missing out on the opportunity to grow. So I, I think even as general employees trying to grow and understand, it's realizing like you are you and you are only you. And there are very few people in the world who even think remotely like you. In fact, there's nobody in the world that thinks remotely like you. And, you know, you've got to learn to understand and appreciate everybody around you and appreciate their point of view, their feelings, and the kind of car they drive, whether it's spotless or dirty. In this third highlight from our collection, we engaged in a sincere conversation with Ben Cohen, Director of Skills Strategy at Degreed, and Nick Retto, Strategic Account Director at Fortfix about the crucial role adoption technology plays in skill-based organization. In this particular segment, Ben explains what skill-based organizations entail and the advantages his clients have experienced from skill-based learning platform. Yeah, so skills-based organization is very much a term of the moment. It's A lot of people are talking about this. A lot of people are, are heavily focused on it. But at its core, the idea is relatively simple. Essentially, it's just making skills be the primary way you understand the people in your organization and the way you 
make decisions around hiring, around development, even around mobility and compensation and promotion in, in some cases. Now, it's not to say it would be the only consideration, but it is always a critical consideration throughout the talent life cycle. So it's just reframing the way that you view and look at people around the skills that they have, this you know sort of collection of abilities that make up that person. And once you do that, it opens up a lot of doors because essentially what it does is it changes your perception of people from what's on their business card, which is what they happen to be doing right now, to a much more broader and holistic view of people of what they could be doing. It's, it opens up a lot of doors for possibilities of, yes, this person happens to be doing this very specific task right now, but if we understand the skills they're utilizing to do those tasks, as well as other skills they happen to have that they just might not be using right this moment, we can much more easily understand not only how we might be able to change processes or, or have these people adapt to new experiences, but also understand where else they might be able to be helpful or, or deployed across the organization. So some of the critical benefits we're seeing early days especially around the learning space, which is obviously near and dear to my heart as, as agreed as a skills-based learning platform. When you start to focus your learning and your development decisions on a skills-based approach, you can get much more specific, much more accurate, much more effective, and much more sustainable with your investments and with the time that you're, you're spending in learning. We had one client who was a mobile device manufacturer who was able to actually reduce their spend on learning by 50% while actually increasing the effectiveness of the learning in terms of time spent learning and content consumed because they were able to be surgical and they were able to be specific of exactly what skills people need to, to do this work or to do new work that we're giving them and match the learning exactly to the problem. Whereas a traditional approach might just be sort of guessing at, well, we think they need this, we think they need that, or you throw everything at the wall and, and you push way too much content that people don't need, aren't interested in. It's just inefficient and it's not super effective. Another yeah. really interesting way to think about the promise of a skills-based organization is your ability to understand your sort of organizational structure or the way that you're deploying talent. Traditional org charts, they're very flat and they're very kind of constricted and constrained to just job titles, maybe a job description that was written five years ago that was sort of vague to begin with. And it's just very difficult to understand what can change, how could it change. But when you add that layer of skills and you really understand what's possible for the talent in your organization, that org chart starts to become three-dimensional. And you can find really interesting opportunities of this group of people over here, even though their job title doesn't have anything to do with this job title over here, the skills are actually pretty similar. So it opens up doors for if these people are interested in moving over here, or maybe there's excess capacity, it just becomes a lot easier and a lot more flexible to make those workforce planning and deployment decisions. And then one of the last pieces, and this is always very important is it's not just about learning and talent benefits of which there are many and many, and I could go on and on, but what is the benefit to our business leaders around this topic? When you're rolling out a new strategy, inherent in that new strategy is, is a change in behavior. You're asking people to do something different. So when you understand the skills that people have, it becomes much easier to understand are our people going to be able to do this new thing that we're asking them to do? Do we have the muscle internally to go on this path that I would like to take us on? If not, how big is that gap? So you can get ahead of it. You can get people ready. You can build those skills. Or you might even decide, hey, we're just really far away from this and we need to bring in some outside talent to help this. But the key is, you know, ahead of time. Rather than roll out the strategy, it falls flat. You don't know why. It turns out six months later, you uncover people just didn't have the skill, didn't have that ability to be able to carry it forward. Another enriching discussion featured Anton Brassad, Global Director of Learning and Development at Philips. While in his conversation with Tamanna, he delved into whether skill-based development can lead to organizational success. He shared real-life examples demonstrating how skill-based development is industry agnostic and essential across organization, regardless of their industry. Yeah, yeah I, I, can, I can talk about some examples, but I think 
theoretically, the concept of skills applies to every single work. A barista at Starbucks has a specific set of skills that the person is hired for and developed for. Mm -hmm. That also happens to the CEO of global financial organizations. So in, in theory, breaking that job into skills, capabilities, and domains of knowledge mm -hmm. applies everywhere. What I think is more ambiguous is where is that transformation more effective mm -hmm. needed mm -hmm. and how and how it is driven and with what effect. That I think largely depends on, on the type of industry you're talking about. Yeah. So happy to give some examples, of course, and maybe that's that's interesting and helpful for the listeners. But I think before talking about the real examples, it can be interesting to talk about the challenges in applying that transformation and that change that I have seen myself mm -hmm. and also of observed by our peers in other industries. So I would say that if you think of a traditional way to do HR, right, to use very simple terms, I think most of us are already trying to keep up with the change in the environment and the skills. And we do this by reacting to the business request for skills. Mm -hmm. So again, in a traditional environment, we as a COE tend to turn to our business leaders mm -hmm. and ask them, okay, what are some of the gaps that you see with skills as you set a business strategy? And then we respond by implementing all sorts of different HR and talent solutions to address that need, right? So for example, your traditional learning and development team may deliver a learning solution. Your recruitment team may recruit a new sort of employee to, to, fill, to fill that gap. And then of course, management leaders they will look into chances to, to look into workforce redesign. Yeah. So that's how it works, I would say, traditionally, right? Well, in my experience, I think this approach is now insufficient because employees constantly need to learn new skills, but not only learn new skills, they also need to unlearn mm -hmm. former skills and former behaviors, right? Yeah. So in that context, hiring a new employee Mm -hmm. is also kind of an unrealistic strategy when the candidate mm -hmm. for skills that are in high demand are in very short supply. Yeah. Creating a new learning solution or leadership development program takes time and it's often delivered when actually the need has mm -hmm. passed. Mm -hmm. It means that for, for the employee, for you and I, mm -hmm. we often find ourselves in situations where we are spending time learning skills that are no longer in, in, in demand yeah, by the yeah. time we're ready to apply. That's the issue with the traditional model. Yeah. I think a third element around the challenges and in, in applying that change is data. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of organizations, the information on skills, and by that, I mean, for example, you, mm -hmm. what are the skills that you bring to the enterprise and what are the skills that you would want to develop, right? So mm -hmm. that consolidation of information, it may not even exist anywhere in the system. Yeah. To this day, many organizations don't capture that data for, for different types of reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, when that information is captured, most of the information is still very fragmented across very different teams. You would have talent acquisition having a set of uh, pieces of data. You would have talent management with another one. You would have your people analytics looking at something else. Yeah. It means yeah. that the leaders of the different centers of expertise mm -hmm. are wasting a lot of time arriving to the same insights or worse to conflicting insights mm -hmm. then you store data that is redundant mm -hmm. and you don't have a chance to look into solutions that are across yeah. various series and hr right so that's 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 really a big challenge is what kind of data is gathered how mm -hmm. it is understood yeah. and the result of this is when we are not having an approach to one people skills data lake, we yeah. cannot understand what I think is a key CEO question, which is for any industry to answer your question, what is the state of supply and demand for critical skills in my organization? That's a question I think we want to answer to CEOs that we are not able to when data is not present. So these are some of the first, some of the challenges that I have seen in different industries. Finally, we are excited to present one of our most insightful and thought-provoking discussions with Ayan Majumdar, Senior Director at General Assembly. During his conversation with Pratyush Sharma, Manager of Sales at Watfix, they delved into HR technology in post-merger integration. Ayan shared an enlightening anecdote about his own experience with a successful integration after a merger. 
Here's that segment. Yeah, I think I can probably reflect on a situation where I was kind of involved in it a few years ago. So a few years mm-hmm. ago, I mean, and that was with my previous organization. And I'm going to say that's about a good five, seven years ago that I was working on a post-merger integration of two companies. And I was actually leading it from the perspective of the acquirer. While my role was to sort of integrate the acquired company into our fold. And the two companies mm-hmm. had different performance management systems, framework, style, and we needed to integrate them into a single system that would be sort of fair, effective for all employees as well. The critical element was that the two organizations were coming from very different cultural backgrounds as well. So where I started off was actually to identify the strengths and weaknesses of each of their individual systems. So we and when I say we, I mean, I'm talking essentially about the, the team that led this work from the start, from the front. And I was kind of leading on this effort and a couple of other efforts on the different HR work streams of post-merger integration. So this was one of those. And we consulted the leadership and employees from both organizations to get their feedback. So after sort of carefully considering all of that feedback, I decided to create a new performance management system that was not the one of the acquiring company and that wasn't the one of the acquired company as well but kind of incorporated the best features of both unfortunately the acquired company here in this case had far more robust systems or processes and that that actually helped us to incorporate some of those best practices also into the fold of this new framework that we were coming up with what i ended up creating in the process was i believe far more objective data driven and technology supported and it provided employees with more regular feedback as well the new system sort of helped to create a far more cohesive post acquisition culture by bringing some of the teams that were core to the value chain together therefore sort of ensuring that all employees were assessed using the same yardstick of performance expectations and they were provided forward looking feedback on similar competencies and similar behavioral expectations as well. So that was, I think, critical in bringing those two organizations culturally on a similar sort of a pedestal and a a playing field. We hope these top five moments have provided you with some great insights. As we come to the end of this episode and wrap up season three, we're excited to hear your thoughts. Please drop your comments on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred listening platform. But wait, this isn't the end. We are coming back with an even more spectacular season four of the Digital Adoption Show. So stay tuned for it. See you soon. 